Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our series of live video presentations. This is uh, our, our next uh, Lunch with the, the Friends uh, uh, webinar here. I'm Chris Knopp, Executive Director of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. And I wanna begin by wishing you all well during the, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we will get through this, um, get through this together. For over 40 years, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness has been the leader in protecting the Boundary Waters and the Quetico Superior ecosystem. And we've been that leader because of you. You are the key to our success. Today, our work focuses on three areas, wilderness, people, and community. Uh, for the wilderness, we're involved in protecting the wilderness from the proposed copper sulfide mines, twin metals, and polymeth. There are two mines and one threat to the wilderness. And just today, we have filed uh, a lawsuit in, in, in federal court with our, with our many partners on this to, to stop Twin Metals. We'll have uh, more information about this uh, coming out. You uh, may have seen some information on, online this morning yet about that. We're very excited to continue this battle to, to stop, stop Twin Metals. For people, through our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program, we connect young people from all across the state to the wilderness through uh, classroom, online uh, programs, and through wilderness uh, uh, canoe experiences. We have a, a scholarship program to get young people uh, of all backgrounds into the wilderness. And for community, we recognize that the communities that are gateways to the Boundary Waters, Ely, Grand Marais, the North Shore, and the like, um, have a shared fate with the wilderness and that these communities must thrive in order for the wilderness to be protected. Uh, one, of the, one of the great things uh, uh, about, about uh, uh, the, well, uh, getting out into the wilderness is actually planning for uh, the trip to get out into the wilderness. And today we, I am so excited that we have a great presentation about route planning in Quetico Provincial Park, uh, discovering Canada's boundary waters. Our presenter is, uh, is Kim Young. Kim Young is a board member of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. She is a, 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 an experienced uh, paddler. She's been to the uh, Quetico uh, for, uh, for more than 40 years. She's also a, a, a distinguished writer. And if you may have seen in the, the Boundary Waters Journal, if you subscribe to this, you will uh, have come across uh, Kim's writing in, in the Boundary Waters Journal. Uh, uh, before I hand it off to, to Kim here, I'm going to a few housekeeping matters. You cannot talk during this presentation, but you can communicate. And at the bottom of your screen, if you move the cursor down there, you will see a Q&A tab. You can ask questions throughout that. And I'll either answer that during the presentation or we'll save that for, uh, for Kim to answer at the end of the presentation. And there's also a chat button down there we can make uh, comments as well, and, and uh, I'll respond to that, or Kim will respond to that at the end of the presentation. Uh, this presentation will go about 30 minutes, uh, followed by question and answer after that. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to uh, hand this over to Kim Young. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you, Chris. And hello, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, the Lunch with the Friends. I'll be talking to you today about our sister park to the north, Quetico Provincial Park. Quetico was established around the same time as the, National, the Superior National Forest in 1919. People in Ontario and Minnesota worked together to have these boundary waters protected. So it's also known as the Quetico Superior Country. Quetico stretches 40 miles north, south, and 60 miles east, west from the border waters of Canada and the US. And I've had the good fortune of going to the Quetico for about 42 years. My first trip was in the summer of 1977. So why go to the Quetico instead of the Boundary Waters? Well, for me, it's less people. There's more pictographs in the Quetico. And I have this thing about, I'm trying to see all the pictographs between the two parks. And it really, it's a wilderness class park with fabulous routes. And there's a lot of history in the Quetico, just like in the Boundary Waters, but it's a little bit more remote. There are abundant red pine um, all over, just like in the Boundary Waters, and some of the largest white cedar in the picture on the left there is located off, just off of Emerald Lake in the Quetico. There are lots of cliffs in the Quetico, and a lot of them have pictographs on them, like on the right there, that's from Payne Lake. There are many more pictographs in the Quetico than in the Boundary Waters. And there's also a number of um, falls that you can 
get into like uh, Louisa Falls here in this picture on Agnes Lake. So Quetico is just to the north of the Boundary Waters and it's connected by the international border. It's north of Ely, it's west of Grand Marais, and it's east of International Falls and Fort Francis. And it's accessed by six ranger stations, three northern stations and three southern stations. And so this map kind of sums up where it's located. And it sort of looks like an arrowhead, don't you think? Now, here there are 23 entry points that are spread out and that can be accessed through those six ranger stations. Dawson Trail, Atacokan, and Beaver House are all accessed via Highway 11, which goes from Fort Francis is to the west and Thunder Bay is to the right. Then there's Cache Bay on Saganagat, Prairie Portage on Basswood, and Lac LaCroix and Lac LaCroix Lake, and they are all accessed through Minnesota. So once you have your permit with your date on it, you basically go to the ranger station either by driving there or paddling or taking a tow. And then um, you will obtain your permit from the ranger and then you'll head out to the lake that you're going to that's on your permit. You can either do a loop or you can go from point A to B and you will actually discuss your route with the ranger so they know where you're going in case there's an emergency. And so when I say take a tow, you may want to take a tow to the Lac LaCroix ranger station because you drive to Crane Lake and then you have to paddle up to the Sand Point Lake to go through customs with your passport. And then you would paddle back down onto Crane and then you would go on the Loon River and there aren't any campsites on the Loon River. And then there are two mechanical portages that fishing boats can go on and you would portage your canoe over and then you would paddle to the ranger station and then you would paddle to your entry point. And so it takes, all that takes about two and a half days if you're just paddling. So that's why I say it's, it's a lot easier to take a tow. And you can do that through Anderson Outfitters or there's other outfitters up there on Crane Lake that will do that for you. So we're gonna go to the next slide. So what are the differences between the Boundary Waters and the Quetico? So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this slide, but the most important thing is you need a passport to go to the Quetico. So four of the ranger stations you actually have to, you would have to cross into the northern part through the border uh, station. You'd have to use your passport if you're on Sandpoint Lake, like I said, or, and then when you come back, you have to show your passport. Uh, the ones that you don't need the passport to get in are the Prairie Portage and Cache Bay, but you need them to get back. And that's where you use the remote area border crossing permits. And so again, you need those for Prairie Portage and Cache Bay on Saganagot because there aren't any custom agents or custom buildings there anymore on those lakes. And then there's the obvious uh, difference between the Quetico and the Boundary Waters that there are no latrines in the Quetico. You have to dig your own cat hole, you have to burn your own toilet paper, and then there aren't any fire grates on the fire pits, so you have to bring your own fire grate. And I always say, make sure you move some rocks and make sure your fire grate fits before you actually build a fire. So to just go over the main points again, you need to have a passport or a passport card. You need to have an RABCA permit, which is actually good for one year and you get it online. And it's good, you can put your whole family on it if your kids are under 18 and your spouse and it costs $30 US. You mail it in six weeks before your trip to make sure that you get it back and then you sign it and you have to bring it with you. So now this is only again, if you're going through Prairie Portage and Cache Bay. But right now you can't cross the border into Canada. So I called the border agency and asked them about the process. And they said that if you know you're going to go, you should still apply. You should download the paperwork, fill it out, mail it to them, and they will do everything they can to get it completed just before they would send it to you. And as soon as they lift the ban, they'll be able to finish processing it and they will mail it to you. So you would get it sooner than if you waited until the end of May. And right now the Quetico is closed until the end of May, but I believe you can still get a permit online for after that. Remember you can get permits online five months in advance, or you can call five months in advance. And 
I just wanted to tell you that the Quetico is a little bit more expensive than the Boundary Waters. So the Quetico or the Boundary Waters cost $16 a person per trip, but the Quetico is per person per night. And so let's say a five day trip in the Quetico would probably be about $100 Canadian, which is about $70 US. If you're going to fish, you need to get a fishing license and an outdoor card, which is good for three years. Your fishing license is only good for one year. And you can do that all online ahead of time, print it out. And um, the outdoors card is only $8.50 Canadian, $9 there on the slide. And the fishing license, there's a, there's a variety of those. So the websites are right on there on the slide. And um, I highly recommend you doing that ahead of time. Not every ranger station can, can do that for you. Okay. So this next map, what I wanted to show you is the portage maintenance map. And it shows all of the lakes and all the portages. And again, there's Highway 11 to the north. So this portage map shows where the Portage crews have actually maintained the portages in the Quetico. They try to do this every three years. They try to get to every portage in the park. And so this is updated regularly. You can go right to the Quetico Provincial Park website and check it out, especially if you're going to go on a remote trip or an ambitious trip and you'd like to know if the portages have been maintained. You can also call, but it's really easy to check this map. Now here's a close up of the map and you can see that there were a lot of portages maintained down by Prairie Portage, which is down here, which is just north of Ely. So storms can also alter that schedule. Um, and I actually got to go help one time after a big storm in the northern part of the park. So now I'm gonna show you some routes and kind of overview the six ranger stations. Um, and we're gonna start out with Prairie Portage. So here's a map on the left showing the moose chain the Moose Lake chain up to Prairie Portage. It's about seven miles. Prairie Portage is the busiest ranger station in the park. And that's what Trevor Gibbs said, and he's the park attendant and superintendent, and that visitation to the park is primarily American. So again, you can paddle the seven miles up the Moose Lake chain to Prairie Portage, or you could take a tow from an outfitter. And an outfitter could get you from their dock to Prairie Portage in about 20 minutes. Otherwise, it's about a three hour paddle. To Prairie Portage. When you come back, this is a little thing that you have to know about. The Boundary Waters in, starts, started to enforce this a few years ago. When you leave Canada and you come back through the Boundary Waters, you need to have this permit that's called number 71. And it's the from Canada permit. It doesn't cost you any money. It, you don't have to reserve it in advance, but you can pick it up at the Forest Service office before you go on your trip and you just have to have it on you when you're coming back. So on the right side, there's a larger scale map of Prairie Portage from the Crismar map that I'll keep referring to, which is a really great map. So when you paddle up the Moose Lake chain, you're gonna come through Sucker Lake and the, the beach is right here where you land your canoe. And then you take the 20 rod portage and here's the ranger station. Over here's the USA, and this is a truck portage that people use to get their fishing boats over into Basswood Lake and fish on the, on the uh, USA side. And there's a dam here, there are floats here, but just be careful. You wanna be really careful when you come up to that part. So here's this route leaving Prairie Portage. That's really cool, it's called the S chain. It's a very classic route for the Quetico, it has a little bit of everything. It's got lakes, creeks, pictographs, waterfalls, difficult and easy portages and cliffs. You name it, it has it. I'm going to describe it clockwise because if you do it the other way, you would be taking two very long portages on the first day. And if you think about it, you are the heaviest with your food the first half of your trip. So first you take off from the beach at Prairie Portage and Prairie Portage is right down here. And I'm going to be showing you the portages on the, from the Fisher map on this route, just to get you kind of uh, used to what I'm talking about. You paddle through Inlet Bay, you go into Bailey Bay, which can be very, very nasty. 
So that's why it's good to take an early tow and get to Prairie Portage early and um, and get through Bailey Bay. And then you would go right here. There's a beautiful beach there. It's about a quarter of a mile long portage. Some people call it the Yellow Brick Road. It's flat, it's sandy, it's beautiful. Then you take, you go to the north end of Burke Lake and you would take a 16 rod portage and then a 30 rod portage and you'd just skirt around the south, the eastern side of the lake, stay close to the shore, and then you would go up this little creek and take a portage into South Lake. So this is, this picture is looking back on that little creek and then there's another portage and into West Lake and then there's an, another portage or you can actually line it or walk your canoe. Uh, at the next portage. So don't laugh at this map, it's pretty old. It's got lots of writing on it. This is one of the original maps that I used. Shade Lake is the second S Lake of the day. It's a very nice lake to stop at and have uh, decide to camp there. When you leave, be sure to take the portage that is right here, not this portage. That's a big X, it's not there anymore. And then if you're leaving the next day, you could go up into the Northwest Bay and you could see two Thunderbird pictographs. There's a picture of one right there on the screen. So Quetico has one of the greatest concentrations of indigenous pictographs in North America. When you visit a pictograph site out of respect and reverence, you should either leave tobacco or sage or cedar in the cracks of a rock. Don't splash or touch the pictograph site, please. Acid from human hands contributes to their destruction. And the elders of the First Nation from Lac La Croix consider it inappropriate to photograph the pictographs. Use your own judgment. I took most of my pictures before I knew about that. So then you take the next few portages into noon, summer, sultry, and then into silence. And you could stop along the way and have lunch or if you, and you could stay at Silence Lake, you could spend the night there, or you could take the eight rod flat rocky portage into Agnes Lake. And if you do that, you wanna make sure that you go just north of there, about a 10 minute paddle, and you will find two snowshoe hair pictogra pictographs, and you'll find some four caribou petroglyphs, which are carvings, although some people think they're white pictographs now. Here's a picture of the four caribou on Agnes Lake. It's very, it's really fabulous. You're sitting in your canoe looking up on this cliff and there's these things that were carved or painted how many hundreds of years ago? Um, could be 200 to 1,000 years ago. Most of the pictographs in North America, with the exception of the southwestern part of the United States, are red. They're made from red okra, which is a soft iron oxide and some kind of oil such as bear oil or sturgeon oil or fish oil. And they were painted with their fingers or with little twigs. The caribou have been reported again, like I said, to be petroglyphs to be carved, but some people think they're white pictographs. And you know, the, lots of caribou lived in the area and there's a lot of caribou pictographs all over Quetico Provincial Park. So as you make your way south, there are lots of campsites and as you make your way to the very southern end, that's where the Louisa Falls is, the one that I was sitting in. It's nature's bathtub, they call it. And so there's a lot of, a lot of people like to go there because it's a pretty fabulous place to go. There's good fishing, link, good fishing on the east shore. Um, and then if you want to take the portage at Louisa Falls, you could actually go into Louisa Lake for a day trip. And it's a straight up hill, about 30 rods, and then there's a little creek, and then there's another 10 rod portage, and then you're in Louisa Lake. It's a challenge. It's one of the most challenging portages in the Quetico. A lot of the campsites have a little bit of sand by them in the southern part there, so that makes for really good fishing. But Agnes is also known for its trout fishing. It's got very deep lake um, in the middle part of it, so um, in enjoy yourself fishing if you go to Agnes. So when you leave Agnes by the south end, you're going to encounter those two large portages that I was talking about. They're affectionately known as the Meadows portages because Meadows Lake is in the middle of them. Some call this portage, these portages Big Agony and Little Agony, 
And some people split them up and they camp on, on the meadows, lake. So the first portage is rocky, rocky, and much more difficult than the longer portage. The second one is longer, but it's really wide. So after you take those portages, you make your way across Sunday Lake and you have a choice. You can either go to Burke Lake via Singing Brook Portage, which is a beautiful lift over and a lot of people like to have lunch there, or you could go down into Sunday Bay via the North Portage. And you can see I have it X'd off because originally I was told to never take that portage, that there were three mud holes. Well, in 2016, I took it and a special Boy Scout group was fixing it and it's really nice. So I would say you should take it if you want to get back into Bailey Bay a little bit quicker, uh, unless you want to go to Singing Brook Portage, which is beautiful. So you should camp on Bailey Bay and then the next day you could go to paddle to Prairie Portage and then you can get picked up or you can paddle down the Moose Lake chain. So another route from Prairie Portage is to go east of Prairie Portage. So Prairie Portage is down here in the lower left corner here. So if you're going to go to Carp Lake, then you wouldn't bring all your stuff over the portage. You just leave your canoes and all your equipment on the beach and you'd hike over, get your permit, come back, paddle through Birch Lake and go into Carp Lake. And if you go to Carp Lake from there, you can go to the Man Chain, you can go to the Knife Lake and you can go to Emerald Lake. And this is the Chrismar Adventure map, um, which is really nice. It's got the whole area of the Quetico and the surrounding area, and it's really great for planning routes and stuff. So now I'm gonna show you this Carp Lake loop that I've taken many times. And you, so you go to Carp and then you would take the portage, the short portage into Sheridan and then take a longer portage portage into this man lake and you stay there for a couple days it's a beautiful lake and then you could take two short portages into emerald lake and stay there for a couple days emerald has that beautiful greenish hue color to it and then the red dot up in the corner that indicates where those large white pines are it's actually a little bit closer on the portage but it's, it's really phenomenal. There's all these big white pines. It's really cool. So you could make a loop back, come back down through Carp Lake by the south end here of Emerald. And then you could spend a couple days on Carp Lake or you could even take a little day trip down to the Isles of the Pines, which is where Dorothy Moulter had her place. Then you could come back or you could go this way too, out. And then you could get picked up at Indian Portage, which is a portage between Birch Lake and Sucker Lake, or you could paddle down back the Moose Lake chain. So now I'm gonna skip over to the other, one of the other Southern Ranger stations, and that is Cache Bay. And that is on Saginaw Lake, which is the lake at the end of the Gunflin Trail. So it's big, big water, as you can see, and you can either paddle it or you can take a tow from an outfitter. And I've used Voyager Outfitters and Seagull Outfitters. They're both really, really good outfitters. You can stay there the night before your trip. So to let you know, it's at least a six hour trip to the end of the Gunflint Trail from Minneapolis with no stops. So most people will leave the day before their permit, have lunch in Grand Marais, drive up the Gunflint Trail, check into the outfitter, and then the outfitter will bring you the next morning and they will bring you approximately from here up the channel and then they'll go here and they'll drop you off right here on Hook Island. And so that takes about a half an hour to take a tow. It would take two or three hours to paddle and if it was windy it would take longer and then it's about a 45 minute paddle over into the Cache Bay Ranger Station. And if you want to meet a living legend, Janice is one of the rangers at the Cache Bay Ranger Station, who has been working there for over 40 years. In fact, there was just an article about her in the Boundary Waters Journal magazine. She's really fabulous. She's really a nice person. So we, the next slide I'm going to talk about is going to the false chain from Cache Bay. And as you can see, you go from, you go Cache Bay, you take Silver Falls, you go to Saginagans, you take Dead Man's Portage, and then you go on to the false chain. And here's a close-up of the Falls Chain from the Chrismar map. 
and that is seven more falls that you will go past by portaging and then go into Canippy Lake. So can a lot of people just take this falls chain, go to Canopy Lake and spend about three or four days there and then go back the same way. So one of the things I wanted to tell you about taking the falls chain is that it's a beautiful route. It's absolutely fabulous, but you do not want to take kids on this route. It's not safe. Um, if a lot of people have died there, when I, the first time I was there in 1989, Janice told me that eight people had died there and many people have died there since then. So you have to pay attention. You have to listen to Janice or the other ranger about where you put in and where you take out and you have to watch the current and it's, it's such a fabulous place to go, but you just have to be really, really careful. So one of the other things you could do here is that you could actually go into Canopy and then go down, take a couple portages, and you would be on Agnes Lake, and you could go down the 17 miles of Agnes Lake and end up at Louisa Falls and go back out down to Prairie Portage. So you can do a big loop. You could, do, you could be, get dropped off at the Gunflin Trail and then get picked up at the Moose Lake Landing. There's so many, so many options for you. So now I'm gonna go up to the Northeast Ranger Station, that's Dawson Trail Ranger Station, and that's on French Lake, and it's right off Highway 11. And there's a nice campground that you can stay at called the Dawson Trail Campground, because again, it's over seven hours from Minneapolis to drive up there. You could either go through Fort Francis and International Falls, or you can go up to Thunder Bay. Again, both are at the ends of Highway 11, and that takes you to the French Lake. So you can get, and one of the neat things about Dawson Trail is that they will issue permits until eight o'clock at night. So if you get there the day before your permit, you can get your permit at eight o'clock at night, and then you can get on the water the next day. Because, and that's really important because it can be really windy on Piccolo Lake. And the other thing you could do is, you could just paddle the next day from where you park your car if you're going on a canoe trip, and then you go on the Pickerel River and you go out to the Pines. The Pines is a beautiful place to stay at. Four or five groups can stay there. And my next picture shows you that beautiful spot. It's a large, large beach, it holds four to five groups. So you can't expect not to share it with people. It's, it's very, very large. And a lot of people bring their kids there for their first time to the Quetico. It's just a beautiful place. And then when you're done and you leave, you can always take a shower at the campground, which is really nice too. So if you were to go further down Pickerel Lake, it gives you lots of options. And I'm going to show you the French to Russell Lake loop. And um, also you could, so you can either go this way to Russell Lake, which is the B chain, or you, I'm gonna show you this way, or you could go this way and go through Pickerel Narrows and you end up on Batchewan Lake and you wouldn't have to paddle. You could spend a whole week on Pickerel Lake and Batchewan Lake, it's really neat. So if you go into Pine Portage Bay and then into Dora Lake, you would go down Twin Lakes and into Sturgeon and then take some, go around some rapids uh, right before you get into Russell Lake and find a beautiful spot on Russell Lake it's got great walleye fishing. It's got Chatterton Falls, which is a wonderful place to fish at and a hike or camp. And on the way back, there's a one mile portage on the Pickerel River and between Oliphant Lake and Fern Lake, which is, it's hard, it's challenging, but it's beautiful. So that's about a five to seven day route. I'm gonna show you some pictures along the route and Here's a campsite on Dora Lake in the upper left. And then on the upper right, that's a beautiful island um, called Lookout Island on Pickerel Lake, which used to have a ranger station there. There's the campsite on Russell Lake, which I think has one of the most fabulous kitchens in the Quetico. And then the Pickerel River at the very end of the one mile portage. It's a beautiful view back to it. Now you're on Fern Lake. Here's a video of Chatterton Falls. I was there last summer and now there is a trail along the right side of the river but it's not a portage. So I actually stopped the group from taking the trail last year. It's, it's fine to walk and hike on but it's not a portage. 
So as you follow this video, now I'm gonna be facing west. And what you would do is you would actually go down here and go around this peninsula, and then you follow the shoreline and you would get to a portage that would take you into Chatterton Lake. Now we're going to go to the next ranger station, which is actually in town in Atacokan. And if you go to Atacokan off of Highway 11, you get your permit and then you would drive east on Highway 11 and then you would go to Nim Lake. And then you would go take a half mile portage into Batchwang Lake. And so, and that's just a nice wide portage. There's nothing hard about that. So from Batchwang Lake, you can go, if you follow my arrow here, you can go into Pickerel Narrows and go into Pickerel Lake. There aren't any portages. You can go south, which is the route I'm gonna show you, or you can go this way into Mel McAlpine Lake. So from Nim down to Batchwang, down to Lonely, you go through Maria, Jesse, Elizabeth, Walter, and it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful route. I was supposed to write an article about the two different ways to get to Russell last year. I got one way from Pickerel and my group got to Lonely and they said, we're done. And it was a beautiful, beautiful campsite. And we decided, yep, we're done. We're going to stay here. And we had some great fishing and we had some great couple days there. So we made our way back and we stayed on Jesse for a couple of days. And Jesse has great lake and great is a great fishing lake. And a lot of people just go into Jesse and base camp there. So now we're going to go to the Northwestern Ranger Station, which is called the Beaver House Ranger Station. And that is off of Highway 11 again. If you were in Fort Francis, you would drive on Highway 11 East and then you would turn on the Flanders Road and then you would drive 14 kilometers, I believe it is, and then you would turn on the Beaver House Road and you land, you end up at a parking lot. And then there's a 120 rod portage or so and then you would cross the lake to the ranger station right here. And that, so it takes about two hours from Fort Francis to the parking lot, just to give you an idea. It takes about two, two and a quarter hours to get from Fort Francis to Atacoka and, and about two and a half hours to get to Dawson Trail from Fort Francis. So after you check in at the Beaver House ranger station, you have two options to go to Quetico Lake or go to Cirrus Lake. Some people do not want to backtrack when they go to Cirrus Lake, so they actually go to Atacokan first and then they go to the parking lot and go into Cirrus Lake. Just an option for you. So this is a really nice loop. Um, you would go take the short portage from Beaver House Lake into Quetico and then go up here. This is actually a really beautiful sandy beach right here campsite. And then there's a whole bunch of pictographs right along this, these cliffs here. There's a beautiful campsite right here. You could take a day trip into Cassacockwag Lake, which has wonderful fishing. And then you take this portage here and go into Cirrus Lake. And Cirrus Lake, you could go right up here and go, Cirrus Lake is huge. You could go see Sioux Falls up here. You could make this as long as you wanted to. And then you would leave by two portages right here and you're back at Beaver House and you take the portage back into your parking lot. Here's some pictures. Um, upper left is the Beaver House Ranger Station Beach, which is gorgeous. And they have picnic, table, picnic tables there. So a lot of people will have lunch there after they get their permit. On the next slide on the right, I just wanted to show you that we, we always try to um, put our food packs up because sometimes there's little chipmunks around. <coughs> Excuse me. On the lower right slide, it's the beautiful pictograph panel site on Quetico Lake that I was talking about. You can see that there's caribou, there's a moose, there's a caribou, there's a moose, probably a bird. This is a Maimai Guashi. Here's a canoe with somebody standing up into it. Here's another Maimai Guashi. Here's a canoe. Here's an X. I mean, there's so many things. It's really fabulous. You can see that white wash. It's like um, kind of covering it up and kind of ruining it for all of us, but um, you should get there if you can. And then on the lower left, I've just got a picture of looking west on Quetico Lake at one of our lunch spots. 
So then the last ranger station that I'm going to talk about is Lac La Croix. And to get to Lac La Croix, you either boat there via the tow from Crane Lake, or you can drive up to Fort Francis, go on Highway 11, turn on the Flanders Road like you're going to Beaver House Lake, and you keep going 79 kilometers down to the Lac La Croix, and it brings you right to the ranger station. It's a gravel, it's unpaved, it's, it's a seasonally maintained bush road, um, but it is doable. I have taken the tow from Anderson Outfitters many times from Crane Lake, and I really like to do that. It's expensive, and they charge per person and per boat, but I'll tell you what, they, put, they take you to Customs on Sandpoint Lake, then the ranger station, and then your entry point, and then they pick you up at a prearranged spot a week later or whenever you want to leave, uh, right on Lac La Croix, and it's really, it's really worth it. So when you are on Lac La Croix, if you take a tow, the lake, uh, the boat on the right is what the kind of boat that you would take, and they bring you to the dock at the customs, and they look at your passports, and then you can, then you're on your way. One of the pictographs uh, on some really beautiful pictograph panels on Lac La Croix is near Warrior Hill, and this is the moose. It's very beautiful beautiful picture. So one of the trips you can take from Lac La Croix is the Twin Falls entry point and you would get dropped off at Twin Falls entry point number 42. You'd go on the Maline River, go over Tan um, around Tanner Rapids, Tanner Lake, and then you would take the Puba Creek and then you would go into Puba Lake and you can spend three, five days here. I've spent five days here just on Puba Lake. It's wonderful. Or you can actually take this portage into Wink Lake for the day and go back to your camp or you could spend a day or two on Wink and then you can get back to the Puba Creek and then you would go out the same way and then you would get picked up up where you were dropped off. One of the other trips you can do is you come from the ranger station, you go down south on Lac La Croix, you go past all those pictographs, there's it, there's many of them. I think there's like 27 pictographs on this panel, on this cliff. And then you go past Warrior Hill, and then you would take Bottle rap, bottle Portage, and then you could go see Rebecca Falls, and then you go by Curtain Falls, you take a half mile portage uphill to Crooked Lake, take a portage into Argo Lake, which is a beautiful greenish hue lake, and they have lots of trout there. And then you could go take a portage into Darkwater Lake, and there are two fabulous pictographs at the south end of the lake. And then you could take the Darkwater River into Min Lake and spend a day or two there. And then you could get picked up at Black Robe Portage or Brewers Rapids Portage. Here's a close up of Bottle Portage and then following the shoreline and going through islands and going to Rebecca Falls. Rebecca Falls is a twin falls. You can see those two little squares right there. So there's a falls there and a falls there. You have to be very, very careful if you go see the falls. And you can actually camp there. That's what the upper picture is showing, um, a friend of mine, when we were there. And then you go, you would leave there, and then you would come to Curtain Falls, and you take the South Portage. It's uphill, half-mile portage, very nice. And when you get to the top, which is right here, you get to the top of the portage. You should actually go to the right, follow a trail that goes about 20 or 30 rods away from the lip of the falls there, and you can put your portages there, your canoes there, and your gear, and you can come back and spend time around the portage and the falls. It's a really, really beautiful area. So these are just a few of the many routes that you can take in the Quetico. I've tried to highlight some of my favorites, and there's just endless possibilities. So if there are any questions that you ha anyone has, I'd be happy to answer them if I can. Great. Thank you so, so much, Kim. There's a, a, a wealth of information there uh, uh, that, that you've given us. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, there are a couple questions from, uh, on some of the basics again. So, so uh, what map, again, do you use when you go to the Quetico? So if you want the whole map, you can get the Crismar Provincial Park and Area Map. And actually, I went, I looked at, I ordered this online 
and it's www.theadventuremap.com. And you can get that. And that, that just gives you the, the whole park, the whole overview. But then when you decide you know where you want to go, then you should get the Fisher or the Mackenzie or the True North clock maps for the area that you want to go to. Okay, great. And, uh, and some of the logistics again for uh, there, you mentioned uh, the remote area border crossing permit, but if you want to go fishing, you need more than just a, 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 a fishing permit. What else do you need? Maybe kind of go over those logistics again. So to fish, you need a fishing license and you need the outdoors card, which is an extra thing that we don't have in Minnesota, but it's a three-year card and it costs $9 Canadian. And you can get both of those online at www.ontario.ca slash fishing and you go online you get your own account and you print it off and it you should do that before you go some of the ranger stations can give you fishing licenses but not all of them can give you the outdoors card and then the remote area border crossing permit so if that is cbsa-asfc.gc.ca and if you go to that site that's the canadian border services agency they will you can go to the remote area border crossing permit and application and you can print it off you fill it out, you have to have copies of your passport or your birth certificate for your children, and then you send it to them with your visa information, and they will get it all ready, and then as soon as the ban is lifted, they will finish processing that and mail it to you. And most of the time, you do that three to six weeks ahead of time, and right now they're just saying, if you do it now, and we lift the ban on June 1st, they will have it almost all ready and they'll mail it out as soon as they can. Great. And a quick question, the, uh, the Chrismar map that you held up there, how do you spell it? Someone wanted to order that. So why don't you hold that up and so people can. So it's the adventure map and Chrismar is C-H-R-I-S-M-A-R. Great. We have lots of other maps of all the other provincial parks in Canada. They're a really great uh, company started by two people. Super. We, uh, we had a question. If, if someone has six to eight days and, and uh, wanted a, a, a relatively easy, e easy trip, which one would you point them, them to? Oh, I'd go to Beaver House. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's relative. There aren't very many hard portages, and there's all the pictographs, and there's great fishing on Cirrus and on Quetico. There's just so many lovely places to visit. It's a, I I can't say enough about Beaver House, Quetico, and Cirrus Lake. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful spot. It's easy to get to. You drive up to Fort Francis, and then um, drive over to the Flanders Road, and it's a great spot. Great. Someone had a question about uh, at Emerald Lake there. Uh, now, are there white pines or uh, cedars? What, is, uh, what, what, uh, what do you have there? You mentioned are there? Oh, did I? I didn't mean I... white pines. If I, I said white pines, white cedars. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful, large white cedars. Okay. Great. Great. There. And, and then, uh, you know, if someone wanted to take. A, a trip with kids uh, uh, what would be um, uh, what would you, what would you recommend uh, would be the the, the 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 trip if you had to pick one for to go with kids on well either the beaver house going into Quetico Lake there's a beautiful um, sand beach campsite on Eden Island so you take one portage from the parking lot go to the ranger station take one portage into Quetico Lake and paddle to Eden Island and there's this beautiful campsite there and there's a few other ones. And that's what we did with our kids the very first time. You could spend a few days there and then go back to Beaver House and there's some beautiful sand beaches on Beaver House. You know, kids like sand when they're young. Um, that's a really nice, easy trip to take. Or you could go all the way down to French Lake and paddle one hour to the Pines and you have a beautiful beach. And it's very, very easy and, um, and very safe. 
Okay, and uh, uh, during uh, the presentation, you talked about the the uh, the, uh, the uh, entry point seventy one permit to return to the U.S. Why don't you talk about that again? How you get it? Okay, so you get it by stopping at the Forest Service, um, the Boundary Waters Forest Service office, and they could give that to you, and it's it's free. It doesn't cost any money. You don't need a reservation for it. You just say, "Hey, I'm going up to Canada." and I'm gonna be coming back on this day, and then I believe you put the day you're coming back on it, and then you just carry it with you. Um, otherwise, you can get it, they say, at any of the Boundary Waters permit self-issuing boxes. Um, but I would think if you like you're in Ely, you might as well just stop at the Forest Service office. And uh, uh, Tim, do you have a, a favorite way of entering the Quetico, going from the north or the south? It, what, what's your, what's your? I know it's tough to pick uh, among your children, right? Which is the favorite? But do, do you have a favorite? Um, it's very hard to tell you the truth. I love going in through Lac La Croix and going to Puba Lake. I've been there a number of times. It is just fabulous lake, and that whole area. And from Puba Lake, I went south over the Memory Lane portages. There's three long portages into Conmee Lake, um, that was a great trip. And then another time from Puba, we went north on the Allen Creek into Allen Lake and into Fred Lake, and then went down into Delahaye Lake, which is the middle of the park. And there's an olive jar there where people have been leaving notes there since 1984. There used to be an older jar there, but someone either stole the notes or broke the jar. But that is one of the best trips is to go to Delahaye Lake sit on that island and read all these really cool notes from people that have been there for many, many years. It's, it's, and then you can come back. We, what we did is we got dropped off up um, on Lac La Croix, and then we had the people, Anderson Outfitters, drive our car back over to Ely. So we did a, like, cross the Quetico. The other really fun places go to at the end of the Gunflint Trail. I love going up into Cache Bay. Cache Bay and Saganagons. You could go spend a whole week on Saganagons Lake alone. Um, and the Falls Chain is just a fabulous trip, too. So it's really hard to pick. When you were talking about the uh, 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 the the uh, pictographs, you mentioned uh, uh, a mono glass. You, what, would you explain what that is? The what? No, you mentioned a, a particular uh, s uh, symbol uh, 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 on the picture. Yes, would you, would you explain what that is? Okay, so a Maime Guashi is the little trickster mm -hmm. of the Indians. They think they live in the rocks and in the cliffs. And so when you are at a pictograph site, you're supposed to leave the tobacco or sage or cedar so that the Maime Guashis will not come to your campsite and play tricks on you, such as, you know, if you don't tie up your canoe, your canoe could be down the shoreline the next morning. So it's, um, it's a little thing that has been um, really suggested that you really want to do this. Um, otherwise, you know, things are known to happen and the, <laughs> by the trickster. Great. Yeah, um, a couple specific questions here. Does, does, does Puba Lake have motorized boats? So Puba Lake is one of the fly-in lakes that the Lac La Croix First Nation can fly into, and then mm -hmm. they have a couple of boats on the lake and that they can guide people. And so, you know, when I first heard about that years ago, I was kind of annoyed, but to tell you the truth, I've been there many times and they fly in and they're there for a couple hours and they, and they fly out. And I just feel that it's very important that the Lac La Croix First Nation people be able to make a living. And it really wasn't that bothersome at all. You know, I, uh, I know that people like to go to the Quetico to, to avoid uh, crowds on the U.S. side here. How, how crowded are the most popular routes uh, in the Quetico? Well, the most visited uh, ranger station would be the Prairie Portage. So if you wanted to get away from crowds, I would say go to the northern entry points. Um, so there, there seems to be a congregation of a lot of people, you know, just north of Prairie Portage because a lot of, it's just easily accessible. You go to Ely, you drive up, you paddle up the Moose Lake chain. And so most, a lot of people go there, but um, 
you know, if you want more privacy, then you should go into the western part by Puba or go into Cache Bay and SAG or go to the northern part. Okay. Uh, Kim, uh, are you planning to go to the Quetico this year? And if so, what, what route are you planning? So I have plans to go to Cache Bay and go up to Saginagans. And so I'm going to take a tow from Voyager Outfitters this year. Last year I took a tow from Seagull Outfitters and I just kind of mix them up and going to spend some time on, Sagan, on Saginagans, which is one like, I think like the second biggest walleye factory in North America. It's, it's, yeah, I should maybe say that, but it's really good, good fishing there. And uh, we're just going to do some day trips. And um, that's where I'm, I'm going to go this year for sure. Great. And uh, another kind of general question here, are, that is, are motorized boats allowed all across the Quetico? No, there are only 10 lakes and that ch and it changes periodically and they're mostly in the western part of the Quetico um, so that the First Nation can guide people. So yeah, it's Cirrus actually is one of the um, lakes, but I've only seen a boat on there a couple times. So, um, and it's a really big lake, but yeah, so there are 10 lakes a year uh, that are motorized. I know we've had some questions about the the uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, quarantine and and uh, uh, and the the um, uh, ban on travel right now. So you you called uh, Canada just this past week, right, or just within the last week here. And the, the latest word again. I know we'll we'll try to keep uh, uh, up to date information on our friends to the Boundary Waters website on, on this, but the most up-to-date information is, is what, what, did you, what did you hear when you called? Um, they said, you know, as of right now, May 31st is the date that, that would be the end of, the, of not being able to go into Canada, but they say that could change. But they said, if you want to get your remote area border crossing permit um, started to get processed they said you should send it in now and so when you fill out that application there's a little spot on the application that says when do you need this so let's say your trip is august 6th so then you may want to put like june 26th just i always put mine um that i needed a few days before i'm supposed to go on my trip or a week before and so they would know that you don't really need this until then um, but let's say you need you you're planning a trip on June 15th So you really want to get that in so they can get it almost all processed and as soon as June 1st hits and It's okay. They will finish processing those Permits and they'll mail them out to you right away So she really encouraged me to tell everyone that was listening today if you are going to an area where you need a RABC the remote area border crossing permit that's either at Prairie Portage or Cache Bay that you get those in the mail right now to them and they will process them as far as they can. And so she really told me to really encourage you to do that. I, I will be doing mine in a couple days. Okay. Great. Uh, well, I know we've had a, a lot of questions here and I'm so grateful for those great questions and and Kim I want to thank you so much for this uh, uh, the, your wealth of knowledge and for sharing it with with everyone this afternoon here and I want to thank uh, all of you that have been uh, part of this uh, uh, webinar thank you for registering it and being part of it uh, thank you for your love of the uh, outdoors and the, the the shared wilderness between the United States and Canada before you you sign off here from the webinar there's a, a couple things here um, uh, first, I, I want to, uh, uh, maybe if you want to move, move the, uh, the slide forward here, we are going to have a special webinar tomorrow at, at lunchtime at 12 noon. And again, we'll have our attorney that, that filed this, this lawsuit to, to stop Twin Metals give you the insight scoop on this latest lawsuit to stop Twin Metals. We will send you that link right after this. We'll send out an email and you can sign up, up for that. If you do not get that link, let us uh, send us an email and we will respond to that. So this will be a, a, a really exciting and timely uh, uh, webinar on the, the lawsuit to, to stop, stop Twin Metals.
And so then, and then uh, uh, second, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, point out that there are, are three three more days for uh, for the, the Give at Home MN. And we have a new $10,000 match that we're, we're trying to to uh, to meet. And if you'd please go to that website, if you like the webinar here and, and likes things like this, if you like the work that we're doing in, in court to protect to protect the wilderness, uh, please go to that website and, and make a uh, make a donation. And if you're a, a new member, uh, this just came out the other, other day here, we have our our, our quarterly uh, um, magazine newsletter here, where we have that you will receive if you're a new a new member, and uh, and we have great stories. Uh, we have a, a feature on on Bud Heiselman here, and and we have up to date information about the lawsuit uh, and the, and fighting uh, metals and polymet as well. So so uh, if you're if you want to become a member and support us, you you will you will get that. Um, uh, thank you so so very much for for joining us. We will make this recording available. Uh, we will send you the link so that you can. Uh, I know a lot of people are trying to take notes, Kim, and and uh, uh, and and uh, having the recording will help them uh, uh, make those notes even better as they plan. And uh, their trip to the Quetico. Um, from everyone at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness, uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And we look forward to having you part of our uh, future uh, uh, presentations, including the one that is is tomorrow about the Twin Metals lawsuit. Have a have a great afternoon. Bye bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye bye.